Are you are you ready? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. All right. Well, let's do a podcast. Let's do a podcast. Um So Hello. I've totally done this. Hello and welcome to Learning the Law, a podcast about all things legal with a focus on current events where we try to teach you things in an hour. My name is Ashley, aka Phoenix Nymphy, and my co-host, who doesn't have to worry about the technical side of things, he just has to be the brain, is the man of the hour. My husband, Ron, the podcast is purely educational and should not be taken as legal advice. This podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship, and this podcast is based on his interpretation of relevant law. Any opinions expressed are the opinions of the individual making them and do not reflect the opinions of any firm, company, or other individuals. Ron is a licensed practicing attorney in the state of California. Yes, I am. Since September of 1999. That was completely last century. This week, the podcast is sponsored by NordVPN. With more than 10 years of experience, NordVPN is a leading VPN provider. NordVPN gives you military-grade protection online, and you can access all your favorite sites without restriction. NordVPN never logs your activity, and when using their their servers, you can always trust your privacy to NordVPN. Thank you for sponsoring us here at Learning the Law. If you use our link, you can have access to all of this and also help out the podcast at the same time. Yep. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> what exactly does that mean? Well, so uh, we like to start off our weeks. Um, how was, you know, uh, how's it been since last Tuesday for you? It's been pretty good. Um, the firm I work at, uh, you know, recognizes in, uh, Indigenous Day. So I got that off yesterday. Uh, which it used to be. Christopher or Columbus Day, but did they make it official? Is that was that the announcement? Okay, it's they it's not officially Indigenous Day, but it should be. It should be changed to Indigenous Day. Uh, The place I work at will not call it Columbus Day. Oh, they just they just won't. Nope. Nope. I know that Biden referred to it as Indigenous Peoples Day, so. I think we're finally in a process of getting that flipped, which has been requested for years. Um, so good. I mean, in all of the stuff we've been dealing with over the last few, you know, months with Biden, starting with the, um, you know, removing of the troops and everything and just because he, he hasn't been doing so great. So he got a win yesterday. So good on him. Um, but can you maybe a little bit further than just acknowledging it and actually make that change? I mean, it, he's like, it's like the bare minimum. He's like every white guy. It's just the bare minimum, man. You're just you're the bare minimum. Come on. And you just step a little bit further and give a little bit more. I think it would take Congress to actually change it. I think it would, but I think um, it would go a long way if the president put it forward. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, if you think about it, (laughs) it's not. um, (laughs) It's a very simple act to do. Just swapping, swapping the day to a different name. Yeah, I agree. Like it's literally the bare minimum Congress and the and and government could do. 
there's so much more that they need to do. Uh, like, oh, you know, stop the pipelines that are going through indigenous lands. But that's a whole okay. other podcast. And I'm going to and I'm getting off the topic. I, I need to rein it in. Rein it in, Ashley. Rein it in. Well, we just had an oil spill off the coast of Southern California. We did. We did. That's. <sighs> we are here for news and politics. We are here to learn the law. Uh, you know, so let's let's focus on the law of today. However, I wouldn't we do in the future. It would be interesting to go over the territory and the treaties and stuff and show exactly how badly showcase exactly how much the government is actually going against their own laws. Uh, when it comes to indigenous peoples, I think that would also be a couple of episodes because there's a lot there. Um, well, if my calculation's correct, if we did one episode per treaty, uh, we could go for about 12 years. <laughs> yeah, we're that that's yeah. Although November is considered indigenous heritage month, I believe. I believe Obama put that into place, correct? Native American History Month? I believe November. Uh, you, you know better than me. I believe no, so November might actually be a good day, to, a good month to, to work on that. Although, with the holiday, that is actually something to bring up. With the holidays coming up, uh, the podcast will not be regular because we will be taking a vacation. Um, so I think think what we will do what i've done with podcast in the past is up until like the week before thanksgiving i do podcast and then we just take the rest of the year off and come back in january so and i think that's probably the best thing to do so that's probably what we will do that way we don't have to worry about because we're going to have a lot of stuff because everybody gets really busy during the holidays we're, you know, we're definitely planning things. So I, um, unless, and it'll give us a chance to re, uh, to address and organize. Cause you know, when we started this podcast, we kind of jumped in it without really, we had an idea of what we wanted to do, but now like we're coming up with all of these more, these interesting things we want to branch out. So, this will be a good time for us to rest, a good time for us to, you know, um, really focus and work on that new content, more of that new content. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that was another announcement that I didn't really think about until just now. Anyway, um, no questions from people. Uh specifically the most questions that i keep getting asked only because i'm a yeah. streamer on twitch is about the twitch content it's coming guys i promise it is coming i promise there is a lot there's just a lot going on with this particular situation that we're addressing because after this uh, after this episode we're going to move on to roe v wade so the twitch lawsuit and all of the twitch hate raid stuff um that we have to do separate outside of the live stuff. So I promise it is coming. I promise. Is that the one we're recording? Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I keep getting the most is more people want to know more about that. And uh, totally understandable because it affects a lot of the people that I know. Completely understand. So. Without further ado, you want to get into the podcast? I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. You want to finish what you were saying? Uh, I just said that's when we're recording. No, no, no. Before that, you're telling us about your week. And I just completely, oh. I am horrible person. I'm sorry. It's ADHD brain, but it's still no excuse. I apologize. No. I, I had a three-day weekend. It was very relaxing. Today was very busy. Had physical therapy. Yeah. You were there. You got all sweaty. I don't, 
I don't think I did all that well, but I didn't do poorly. Well, you're having to adjust the way you used to walk. I mean, you're you're learning how to walk again, and it's not the same way that you've walked for 54 years. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that there's a lot with that and it's going to be a process. Yeah. And and it, it it sucks. That's all I'm going to say. It does, but doing what you're doing now what is think of it this way babe you're creating the base and then you're building from there oh i know it's just gonna take a long time it is it is so back on the lawsuit do you remember where we stopped at I believe it was page 11. Yes, it was. I was just making sure that you remembered. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I was totally not making sure that I remembered correctly. Mm -hmm. Actually, I do have it on page 12 right here. (laughs) Because we're at the start of page 12. Yes, yes. And just... uh, just, I guess, for those who are listening to this and didn't listen to the previous podcast, we are going over the lawsuit that the DOJ filed in September against Texas for their abortion law. Now, there has been some updates on this process so far. We will get to those at the end of the podcast and talk about that at the end of the podcast. Okay, you don't want to talk about it now? I think we should get this established first and understand what they're doing and then talk about, I think it would be better, and then talk about the updates on this. Okay. So, as you recall, hopefully, we were talking about the enforcement of the law. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty much deputizing the citizens of Texas to bring lawsuits. And that's the type of language they're using in this uh, in this lawsuit. Right. So here we are, top of page 12, paragraph 35, where you have the Department of Justice telling the court that these private citizens are really state actors. And they are agents of the state. And therefore, Texas itself is not immune from being uh, sued right? for, you know, unconstitutional law. And so in, in 35, they just they say the individuals are state actors to the extent that they are significantly involved in conduct that would be unconstitutional if engaged in by the state of Texas itself or Texas has sanctioned their conduct. And they cited a case where uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court decided that there was state action where there was racial discrimination in the housing market. Mm-hmm. So it, that's an ana- analogous where you're going to find unconstitutional actions by these agents of the state can be reflected back onto the state itself because they're the one sanctioning it. Uh, So can you explain that in a way that I understand? Please. Um, So basically... um, Okay, here you go. If you're a real estate person... mm Mm-hmm. You need to be licensed by the state to have a real estate license. Yes. So if you are racially discriminatory and only showing certain sections or certain neighborhoods to white clients and not to uh, minorities, that would be racial discrimination, correct? Yes. And I'm pretty sure there have been several cases about that particular scenario in multiple places 
Okay, so the Supreme Court found that because of the licensing, there was state action, i.e. government action, in that racial discrimination. Oh. So they basically said, Texas, you've got to stop them from doing this or else you are held responsible for allowing this to happen. I, I'm not sure that the case they're citing was from Texas. It's just a Supreme Court case from 67. Okay. But I, basically I saying that, okay, so whatever state that was that that happened in, that state is responsible for those real estate agents because they're the ones who give out the license. The license. Right. So the analogy is, Texas, you've deputized all your private citizens. What you're doing is unconstitutional on its face because it goes against Roe v. Wade. And therefore, there is government action. You can be um, held liable for the unconstitutional law. Oh, that's what so the DO that's what the DOJ is saying. If mere licensing of a real estate agent is government action then deputizing all the private citizens in the state should also be government action. Okay, I gotcha. Okay. So I have a and question. The, I yeah. just this just came What about so we get our our driver's licenses from the state? Yes. So Could they be held liable for something that we do in the car if we're driving Could the state because they allow that person to have the car? That is a great question. Or they allow the person to have the license to drive. There, there is government action allowing that person license to drive. Now, why doesn't the state? Be involved in every single car accident. I mean, that would be absurd, but because one, it, it would be absurd, but two, when you get the license, you have taken a test. You are presumed to be not negligent in the operation of the car. And the operation of the car does not violate any kind of constitutional right. Okay, well, a real estate agent has to take a test to get a license. Correct. So what's the difference? Because he's violating a constitutional right. And it's in the discrimination. Ah, you're not necessarily violating a constitutional right because you don't have a right to drive. You have a it's a privilege. It's not. It is a privilege. That's where the it's difference a, comes to. It's. It's also a privilege to be a real estate agent. But the practice that they are doing is a right that they are doing is against people's personal right. rights. So it right. would have to be. So basically it'd have to be someone who uh, is mowing down minorities. It's like <laughs> essentially on, in their car. That's when like. Even so. Yeah. Anyway, disregard what I just said, but okay. Uh, basically it'd have to be someone who, if you are, if you get a driver's license and then you're like, all right, well, I'm going to go mow down, you know, everybody in the ghetto in my car. Cause the state gave me the ability to do that. Would that even be the equivalent or it's still not equivalent because. Uh, you could make the the analogy, mm -hmm. but that person's going to be charged with murder. Oh, absolutely. Um, and or attempted murder, right? And if you tried to sue the state over giving him the license, the state would just claim government immunity. So, in practicality, you're not going to sue the state for that. Now, at the same time, when it comes to the real estate. And I'm just like spitballing stuff here. So 
at the same time, though, you have, um, you know, these real estate agents who are. Um, this is this particular I don't know the. The details of this particular. Um, suit they're re referencing, but I would assume it meant they they brought it up because the state wasn't doing anything after being brought to them. That would be my assumption. Like when it comes to the driver, the state absolutely takes action against you <laughs> and will revoke your license, your driver's license. They do it all the time. Um, so like, you know, you know what I mean? Like there's also that working, like we don't, there's that difference. It's just, something that just popped into my head we can move on it was just a okay. thought i was just i'm just arguing things in my head my brain is like going a thousand miles a minute right now and it's just all over the place so we're okay. gonna have to rein me in okay well yeah the real estate doesn't really have anything to do with with this so, i know uh the next section um uh, it's section three and it says SB8, the heartbeat of, uh, law, affects interstate commerce. And the, the reason this is important is only Congress can pass laws that affect interstate commerce. It's what's known as the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Um, and they've used the power of that Commerce Clause for numerous things over the years. For example, uh, one of the things that happened during the Civil Rights Act is they use the Commerce Clause as a way to um, integrate eating establishments. That's right. I remember you talking about this before. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Paragraph 36, they're saying by uh, and it's right there by stripping women of their constitutional rights to certain abortion services in Texas, as well as outlining many of the commercial services that provide abortion services. SB 8 forces women who wish to obtain these services to travel out of Texas to other states, i.e. interstate, in order to exercise their constitutional rights. And thusly, that's uh, a prohibited, uh, a law that's prohibited, and only Congress can do that. So basically, because it forces women out of state and the fact that they still can get sued, that's why that's important. Well, well uh, it forces them out of state and they have to do business out of state, i.e. commerce. Yeah. And, and they can the still next... get sued for going out of state. Yeah. But that doesn't have any bearing on the commerce clause. Oh. The the suit itself. Just the fact that you have to go out of state and it's a business for a business purpose. Yeah. That's all you need. Theoretically, and I think I've said this before, Congress can regulate your kid's lemonade stand on the corner of the streets. Because theoretically cars can come from other states and pass by that lemonade stand. Mm, yeah. So, and uh, the next paragraph goes into... I want to um, say there was a case. God, am I... Re I feel like there was a case where some kid's lemonade stand was forced to shut down for some reason. God, I wish I could. Oh, really there's been there's been state cases and county cases a lot where, you know, they didn't have the license to be a food provider like a food truck is or a sidewalk vendor. And, and it's like shut, it's a kid's yeah. it's a kid's lemonade stand. Why are we? It's so weird. Anyway, so. Anyhow, the next paragraph goes into how it's already affected commerce. 
Um, and they're sh showing that the clinics in, uh, they say, Oklahoma, Louisiana, New Mexico, Colorado, and Kansas are being inundated with the surge of pregnant people. Uh, one clinic in Oklahoma reported that after SB8 went into effect, the number of calls it received from Texans increased from approximately three to five calls per day to between 50 and 55. Jesus Christ. So it's affecting these other states' clinics to provide a constitutional medical service. And that affects interstate commerce. Yeah. So, um, and once again, only Congress can do that. Yeah. Okay. We're just now at thir page 13. Can we? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going on. Okay. Okay. Paragraph 38, 39. 40, once again, go through this. It's affecting interstate commerce. Okay. Now, finally, page 14, you get to the first, uh, like, cause of action section where it says SB8 irreparably injures the United States. Wow, that's some language. Holy crap. That's, that's yeah. some harsh language right there. Yeah. Subdivision one, it injures the United States by depriving women in Texas of their constitutional rights while seeking to prevent them from vindicating those rights in federal court. So not only <laughs> are they being denied the abortion service, they're being denied the right to go to federal court to get that. Yeah. To get an order for that service. And uh, I would like everyone to please remember that the legislature excluded themselves from this law. Yes. I wish they would bring that up in this. Yeah, I don't know if they, they do or not, but, you know, it's good to be the king. And so on page 14... They go into exactly how the U.S. is being uh, irreparably injured. And basically, by denying your own people the rights provided by the Constitution, that is irreparably, irreparably harming the United States itself because the United States is, of course, we the people. Yeah. And it just goes into detail explaining. It looks like what it's doing is it's just taking that idea and just breaking it down and giving excessively more detail on what they mean by that specific idea. Right. And, you know, you can't place an undue burden on it, which they go into detail on exactly why this is an undue burden. Right. Yeah. And and then uh, subsection two, which is on page 15, SB8 unconstitutionally restricts the operations of the federal government and conflicts with federal law. Reason this is important is the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution says federal law trumps over, i.e. overrules, any conflicting state law. Which was referenced earlier in one of the earlier pages as well. Correct. You'll find a lot of legal pleadings are repetitious. Redundant? <laughs> Redundant too, but yeah. Basically, you introduce by telling them what you're going to argue, then you argue, and then in conclusion, you tell them what you just argued. Yeah, it's it's a college paper, college argument yeah. paper like that's it's a college research paper is what it is. Now, uh, as you go on. You'll see that 
one of the things they're saying is that SB8 is going to interfere with the Department of Labor Job Corps program. How? Interesting. The Job Corps program assists eligible young people between the ages of 16 and 24 with completing their high school diploma, gaining gainful employment. Um, let's see, how is it going to interfere with that? I'm scrolling through. Job Corps regulations specifically require the Texas Job Corps contractors to provide medical services through provision or coordination of a wellness program, which includes access to basic medical, dental, and mental health services, which would include abortion services, federal program. Job, because Job Corps is a federal program. Okay. Yeah. You can't deny them for, with the state law. Wow. But that's what this would do. Yep. Okay. okay. That's and the, so. That's just basically yeah. them saying, "Here's more, con more reasons why this state law is wrong, and just more evidence. It's just more evidence that they're bringing it, forward." This would be an example by analogy that would also include any military members in the state of Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the second program that would be uh, impacted apparently is the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So, you know, the refugees that we do have coming from, say, Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, would be impacted. The Bureau of Prisons. Um, you know, federal would be impacted. All the centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, you know, if, uh, which again, federal programs that provide medical services would be impacted. All these things, state law cannot change. Office of Personnel Management? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the federal, uh, all the federal workers. Wow. The and DOD. That's uh, that's your military. Okay, there's yeah, the military, I, and then yeah. wow. So they just basically went through and labeled all of the federal things that exist in this state that this will affect. The big ones, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's more, but you know, right, right. They can't make this a thousand pages long. Jeez. Okay, and then um, on page 24, you got the third section. The harms that SB8 inflicts are imminent and traceable to the state. Now, what does that mean? That means that, one, um, the harm to women is pretty much immediate or can, will shortly be immediate. Okay. Because of you know, how soon. Because yeah. one, you know, there's pregnant women in Texas all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, so their, their harm is imminent if they want to get an abortion according to their constitutional right and they're being denied that right. Yeah. So they're being harmed. The second part is it's traceable to the state, even though the state denies that. And the reason it's traceable to the state is once again, all these people have been deputized by Texas to sue. Even though it's not Texas suing. And even in almost encouraged by the language, like they're encouraging them to do this. Yeah. And so, you know, that is the lawsuit, the arguments in the lawsuit. The next section, 24, which is a section for any lawsuit uh, that you file, state, federal, you got to give your claim of relief, what you want. Okay. And so 
Um, count one, supremacy clause. Fourteenth Amendment. So what's they the claims want- of relief again? Claims for relief. What is that? A uh, claim of relief is what you want the court to do what you want the court to find. Oh, okay. 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 Um, I'll give you an example. Personal injury suit. First claim of relief is going to be for uh, damage, property damages. Gotcha. 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 So this is where you get the damages for the stuff. Okay. All right. Yeah. So the first one is uh, they want the court to find the supremacy clause overrules SB eight. The 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. Which uh, gives the U.S. Constitution powers over the state. And it was enacted after the U.S. Civil War. Yeah. Okay. The second one is preemption. What does that mean? That means that... Uh, SB8 is violating the supremacy clause and it is preempted because it is contrary to the U.S. Constitution. That means it needs just to be removed. Okay, okay. All right. And then you got the count three um, where it's a violation of intergovernmental immunity. Where and that is basically SB8 directly regulates the activities of the federal government and its contractors, grantees, and non governmental partners, as was shown before with the DOD and yeah, Job Corps and that. And SB8 therefore violates the federal government's intergovernmental immunity and is invalid. Okay, so. 26, they want a declaratory judgment stating that SB8 is invalid, null, and void. They want a preliminary and permanent injunction against the state of Texas, including all of its officers, employees, and agents, which includes the private parties that would bring suit and prohibiting all and any enforcement of SB8. Those are the two things. And then the next thing is something that, um, is pretty general when you want kind of injunction and relief. Any and all other relief necessary to fully effectuate the injunction against SB 8's enforcement. Wow. Okay. Um, then, you know, D, uh, D, this is a pretty standard clause that the court award the United States its cost in the action. You know, that's like the, uh, the the person injured in a car accident asking the court for its cost to bring a suit against the defendant who is neg- negligent. Oh, so yeah, Texas needs to pay for the cost of all yeah. of this bullshit. And you can bet that's a pretty hefty price tag. That basically it's a fine on Texas for being for for bringing this crap up because it's just nonsense. Right. Is what they're and asking then- for. And then um, any other relief that the court deems just and proper. Fair enough. And then, you know, it's got everybody who's signed it. Right, right. So that's your 27 page complaint. (sighs) Um, So what's the updates on this so far? Okay, on October uh, 6th. The, uh, a judge in the Western District Court of Texas. This is a federal ordered, judge. A federal judge, yeah. Ordered an injunction stopping the enforcement of SB 8. Okay. Um, and so for. This is two an days, actual Texas federal state ju- federal judge. Yeah, it's an actual federal judge in, in Texas. the Western District district in texas yes yeah and so what happened then was the state of texas brought an emergency appeal to the fifth circuit um court of appeals texas is in the fifth circuit and so what you're saying is the state of texas appealed what one of their one of their judges said 
Yeah, they appealed what one of the federal judges said. Yeah. And a three judge panel um, basically said that the injunction given by the district federal court is inoperable at this time. The, so the law went into effect again. And they, they, what do they uh, mean that, by at this time, though? Because it's a three judge panel. The entire court of appeals needs to hear a case. Okay. Generally. So the three judge panel, uh, one was a Clinton appointee, one was a George W. Bush appointee, and one was a Trump appointee, um, in case anyone's keeping score, said <laughs> that the DOJ had until uh, today at 5 p.m. to respond. Because, oh, okay. Um, and if they want to be heard by the entire um, court, which generally that's what happens. Okay. Um, you first go to the three judges. You you pretty much get to pick out the three judges that you want to hear your case. And then it will go to the entire case. The The district court, the federal judge, gave a 113-page opinion. Holy crap. Yeah. 113 pages on why this law is unconstitutional. It was it was pretty thorough. Okay, I'm just I'm just curious. Was this federal judge who because basically this started the appeals process on this particular yeah. uh thing. So now we get to see if it's gonna get even get to the Supreme Court. So the federal judge, Robert L. Pittman, white man, who was yes. Okay, as far as I know, that's what I, I wanted to they've, know. They haven't given him a, a picture, but I believe he is. I, I could be wrong. I'm. He wasn't, I'm. Color me impressed. He was an Obama appointee. Okay. And. Um. He wrote that it is substantially likely that the courts that the courts will find SB eight violates the Fourteenth Amendment, citing multiple comments and testimonies from uh, clinicians, patients. Judge ruled that the law places an undue burden on women seeking abortion in Texas and thus violates her rights. If this situation does not constitute an undue burden, it's hard to imagine what would. And then, you know, he said some things about, you know, the Supreme Court not not doing its job, apparently. He I haven't gone through. Wait, he called out the Supreme Court? That is Ballsy. the power <laughs> of a federal judge and a lifetime appointment. That's some ballsy stuff right there, though, yo. Federal judges have no Fs left to give. Is this why you want to be a judge? I would love to be a federal judge. <laughs> That's wow. The, the, the only time they have F's left to give is if they want to be appointed up the ladder. You know, up to the Court of Appeals or up to the Supreme Court. Jeez. Some judges don't care about that. Wow. That's. I, in, I, I'm I'm I like I don't. Wow. In. um. What am I trying to say? The the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal, in their opinion, overruling this judge, gave a short one page <laughs> opinion. I love how the that, people who don't really have a leg to stand on never come back with a list. It's just like because I don't want to, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's basically. Uh, what this one page opinion from the Court of Appeal said was basically, um, we're going to agree with the Supreme Court that uh, it needs to just go through the, the system. 
but we're going to let it go into effect. But it doesn't. And yes, it doesn't need to go through the system. We all know what needs to happen. I just end just, it. I just Googled Robert L. Pittman. Uh, he is an older white man. Okay. Uh, we apparently had the same hairstyle. Of course. Yeah. Because uh, apparently a lot of judges are bald. Well, you'll fit right in. And interesting to note, his alma mater was Abilene Christian University. That is actually very interesting. See? You, <laughs> you can't judge a book by its cover. Um, that's really ballsy to call out the Supreme Court, though. Like, I'm not even going to lie. Like, that's. Wow. I mean, and that kind of brings us to the end of the podcast. Oh, what? One other. He is the first openly. He was the first openly gay U.S. attorney in Texas. U.S. attorney. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There it is. There it is. I knew it had to be something. Because <laughs> anyway, going to rein in my opinions, but that's cool uh, to learn a little bit more about that judge. Uh, and I think that's I respect him for being that ballsy. Uh, however, this wraps up our discussion on the abortion law with Texas. Which means our next podcast is going to be Roe v. Wade. Right. And it which and just so people know, Roe v. Wade just doesn't say uh abortion's legal. No, I was it, gonna it goes into much more detail than that and why. And this is the Roe v. Wade miniseries is going, I don't know how long it's gonna be, but it's gonna be a few episodes. So come along with us on that ride. But yeah, Roe v. Wade, not just about abortion. Correct. So I hope that y'all have enjoyed so far um, our take and understanding on these lawsuits and and bills uh, that have come out. Um Also, we'll give an update on what uh, the DOJ did today. Once we have information. Yeah. Yeah, because we'll get more information. We'll definitely, again, with this, with the blizzard, like, uh, we got to keep up with the blizzard lawsuit as well. We need to look and see what. Oh, there's updates on that. There is updates on that. Okay. Yes. You want to give a quick update on that? Um, did we... Did we say that the EEOC uh, settled with Blizzard for 18 million? We did talk about that because we okay. wanted to address that those are two different lawsuits. They're not the same lawsuit. Right. right. Now, the uh, California Department of Fair Education and Housing has gone in to uh, contest that settlement. What? Yeah. They're contesting it. Another. Um, uh, group that is suing Activision Blizzard has contested it and mainly they're contesting it because it will impact their, their lawsuit. lawsuit. Yeah. So, so by contesting it, are they saying, no, you're not allowed to settle. You can't settle this. You're, you're not. What, correct. Oh, like you're going to have to go to trial for that. Yeah. Or at least the settlement is going to have to be stayed until our lawsuit's over. Because they. OK, so can you explain why, why? they would do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because 18 million dollars to the number of people. It's nothing. Affected is nothing. And so. If say then. Um, the the state gets a hundred million dollar judgment in this, right? Yeah, I'm just throwing out a number. They can appeal that hundred million dollar judgment, and they can say, uh, "Court of Appeals, this violates the consciousness of the court." 
the federal government only wanted 18 million. How, why does the state want a hundred? Oh. Yeah. So the state is like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. That's too little. We're not doing that. You're going to hold off on that. Right. That's basically what the state said. That's what they're wanting. California yep. ain't pulling no punches, man. California is not pulling punches with Blizzard Activision. <laughs> Good. So where are we at with that? Where are they at with that? Like, is it, um, uh, have they put a stay on it or? No, nothing's been, been ruled yet. So if they do put a stay on it, could afterwards, after the California lawsuit, could the, what is it? OECC? EEOC. EEOC. Could they yeah. then request more? Um, yeah, they, they the could state, relitigate the whole thing. A settlement can always be backed out of until it's signed. I wonder why the federal, why did they try to get this settlement, but not the state settlement? Uh, because I, I think that Activision Blizzard was so short-sighted on how this was going to affect them and their business and how much money it could possibly cost that they, they pretty much ignored it. I'm going to, I hate to say this, but I think that this might be the end of Blizzard. Well, I mean, the uh, Blizzard. Blizzard, Blizzard stock tanked uh, more than the 18 million that they're settling with. I can't tell you how many of my friends are just so many. I mean, so many people are just done with Blizzard and like, it's just, it's tainted. It's just tainted. Even like. I, I, you know how I am. I like to go back in and and play every couple of months and I'm just like. Because I like the classic. I was really enjoying enjoying Burning Crusade. But uh, and I love leveling with you and playing with you. But I just it's tainted. Like, I just don't have that desire. I understand that. And like, even with Overwatch, I'm just like, I love the thing is, I love Overwatch. And like, I saw the new skins. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. I want to go play. And then I'm like, but I don't. But I don't. I even uninstalled it. I'm done. Like right now I'm done. Like I'm just because, and I can't explain it. Like, yes, I've had so much good. I have so many friends because of wow. I have you because of wow. Like I have so many good memories from blizzard games, but I also have very tainted memories from blizzard games. And this actually doesn't help and so just yeah no i understand that and i wouldn't be I surprised do. if old farts like you eventually got done with it because of the lawsuit because it's just you know eventually uh, in the meantime though there are a lot of uh women that kept their jobs that are there yeah. Hoping that things get better. Right. That's here. That's the thing, though. You've got to have people in it. I mean, we were discussing this just the other day. Like, you've got to... Because you had suggested that we should have... We were specifically talking about Twitch, y'all. All right, we're going to wrap this up here soon. But we were talking about Twitch and how there's no real competition off against Twitch right now. Uh, Facebook gaming is just garbage. YouTube live streaming is getting better, but it's not where Twitch is. Um, and the real competition that Twitch had was bought out by Microsoft and Microsoft just let it fall under. They just dropped the ball on it. And um, Ron, has as Microsoft is want to do. Yeah, they do that yeah. all the time. Um, and Ron had suggested that, you know, we create a, a a all women built platform where it's women who are head of 
you know, the company and not, and, and not, um, advertise it as like female Twitch or ladies Twitch. Right. Like, which I think that's what kills a lot of stuff that is female led, that is led by women because they advertise it as led by women instead of just saying, Hey, this is a new product. Try it out. You know what I mean? But right, because when you, and I'm going to say this as an, as an old white, fat, bald guy, uh, when you do that, that tells me quote unquote, you know, that you don't want me to be part of your, your marketing. Right. It isolates a com- it isolates an entire market. Um, and so advertising specifically for women or even for men is really just gendered marketing is just bad. Um, so, uh, you know, it would be great to have competition for Twitch. I think that would be fantastic. It would be great to have competition for other game devs that have women at the helm, right? It would be fantastic to have that. However, you also need those women that are at Blizzard actively helping change it because had it not been for those women, we would have never learned about it. We, it would have not gotten to where it is. So there is no right way to make these changes. You have to do it all. We need, you know, yeah, let's get some girls who can code and create a new platform and try something new out. That would be so cool. And have the women who work at Twitch to help do better. I know I've got, I know quite a few people, uh, quite a few ladies who work at Twitch and one girl who was actually on the Girl Streamer podcast um, now works at Twitch and she's trying to help that change from the inside. Um, so, cause I know that a lot of people have been giving these, these women crap for still working at these companies. And it's like, no, they're also doing a service. They're also on the ground working. There is no exact way you have to do it all. And that's what's anything that needs big change because it is systemic that, so, you know, those officers that are working in, you know, in police, in the police force who are trying to help. Cha- it's hard to change it when you have institutions like that from the inside. It's hard to make those changes and it's hard to be that person on the inside. Uh, it's really easy to be on the outside and go, well, you're just a part of it. But are you? Are they always just a no, they're not. They're not always condoning it. So keep that in mind when you're talking to people when it comes to this kind of stuff, you've got to have it from all sides to make it change. Whether it's the, this abortion law, whether it's, you know, women's rights, civil rights, people, human rights, you've got to have it all. Um, You've got to work at from all angles to help people see and understand and make those changes. And on that note, we'll end the podcast. Thank you so much for listening to Learning the Law. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, and share in all your favorite places. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Learning the Law, Ron at NecroKijo, and me at Phoenix Nymphy. If you have any questions, please tweet, comment, or email us at twolazydogsmedia at gmail.com. This has been a Two Lazy Dogs production. Bye, everyone.